Good evening to you all. I'm going to turn to Ephesians chapter 4, please. Ephesians 4, and I'm going to meet you there here in just a moment. Now let me say how good it is to be with everyone again tonight. So very thankful for the hospitality of this congregation. And again, I stress it's, it's second to none. We, my whole family, has felt very welcome. Uh, our kids are not with us this evening. Uh, they have been taken and picked up by some of our friends uh, that were here last night. And they've gone to the Summer Youth Series in Pittsburgh tonight. But uh, Holly and I are most definitely glad to be here with you. Ephesians, the congregation there has a, a long and wonderful history in the New Testament. We see its establishment all the way there in Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 19, we see a little more about them. In Revelation chapter 2, we see Jesus through John speaking to them. And as he did with most of the seven congregations in Asia Minor, there were things that were lacking. And in Ephesus, they had left their first love, and Jesus wanted to make sure that they would go back to that. But as with most of these congregations, there was also something positive said about the church in Ephesus. And that positive thing is that they hated false doctrine. Couldn't stand it. And you look at their history, how they started, and the words that Paul warned them about in his epistle. Really, you could even go back to Acts chapter 20, and when, which Paul met with the elders from Ephesus. He called them to Miletus, and he warned them. He said, after my departure, grievous wolves. He's talking about false teachers are going to come. And he says, you've got to be on guard. You've got to protect the flock. Look what he says to them in his epistle. By inspiration, in chapter 4 and verse 14, he says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Paul says we can't be like children. Children, my children, are gullible. And uh, you say something, they go, oh, no, no, no. And, and they, well, is it really? Is it really? They don't understand jokes. They don't understand things in which you might be figurative. They, they're gullible individuals. And we sometimes as Christians can be gullible individuals. And someone stands up and he's got a suit coat on, he's wearing a tie, he's got a Bible open before him, and he's standing behind a pulpit. That doesn't mean that we automatically believe what he says. We've got to check. We've got to be like those noble Bereans in Acts chapter 17, and they searched the scriptures daily. And who were they checking? They weren't checking just some regular preacher. They were checking an inspired apostle, someone who was speaking for God, and yet they still checked him. I'm not inspired. You've got to check me. And I know Scott would say the exact same thing about his preaching. You've got to make sure that what you hear and what you believe is indeed from God's amazing word. Look at the next chapter. Look what he warns them about in verse 11. He says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Now, the King James Version says, But rather reprove them. I, I really like the way the New King James translates this. It says, But rather expose them. There's a sense, and while we aren't spending every sermon, and it would not be balanced preaching at all if we did, we're not spending every sermon attacking false doctrine. But at the same time, if we're going to be responsible Christians, there's going to be times in which we must talk about false doctrine. Go back just a few verses to verse 6 and notice the warning that he gives there in that verse. He says, Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Verse 7 says, Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Vain words. Empty words. Jude would describe false teachers in, in his epistle. Several different illustrations. He talks about them being clouds without water. You know what that is, right? That's a, that's a cloud that promises something, but it's an empty promise. It's saying, here's rain, and then it passes by, and rain never comes. He describes them as late autumn trees who should by this point have produced fruit. They would promise fruit and yet give nothing. 
He called them wandering stars. At this time, in order to navigate, you had to have what? You use the stars to do it. What's a, what good is a wandering star? It's leading you in the wrong place, isn't it? That's what false teachers are. Over and over and over again, God warns us of the dangers of false teachers and the false doctrines that they bring. They're vain and empty promises. You remember as a child, maybe as a parent or a grandparent, you remember your children being warned of this. Uh, when I was a child, uh, we always had... McGruff the crime dog. Y'all remember McGruff the crime dog? He'd take, take a bite out of crime, right? And he'd come to our school and he'd tell us, don't talk to strangers. Or he'd add this, don't take candy from strangers. Why do we tell our kids that? We tell them that because we know that the candy that those strangers are offering are vain and empty promises. They are loaded with consequences. False doctrines are like candy that the denominational world, and sometimes, sadly, they even pop up in the brotherhood, and they offer something that is false, something that is a doctrine that takes us away from our Heavenly Father. And so I don't want to look at false doctrines regarding heaven. I, I've tried so, so very carefully to make this gospel meeting as balanced as we possibly can be with some positive and some negative. Tonight we, we talk about the negative. We talk about things that are being taught that are vain and empty, and, and we can't believe them. Some of these are from our denominational friends, and it's never our intention. Hear me out, dear brethren and, and dear friends, if you're visiting with us. It's never our intention to simply just make you mad. The only person I want to make mad is the devil. That's who I want to make mad. Uh, but we will be talking about some false doctrines in order to keep the command there of Ephesians 5 and verse 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. We've got to point out where the poison is so that we as members of the body of Christ know not to imbibe of that poison. I'm going to start, I'm going to go through some of these pretty quickly. And I want to start with the Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witness have their own version of heaven. Just a, a few weeks ago, we had uh, uh, two nice men stop by and ring our doorbell on early on a Saturday morning. It always seems they come early on a Saturday morning, don't they? <laughs> and here they are, and, and uh, they wanted to know about how I was prepared for eternity. And so we, right there on the steps, had a, an impromptu study, and uh, we got to talking about heaven. And he, one of the men there said, uh, I don't want to go to heaven. He said, no, I I, God's got something prepared for me right here on this earth. And that is the false doctrine of the Jehovah's Witness religion. In Revelation chapter 7, and again in Revelation chapter 14, there is a number that is given. That number is 144,000. Understanding first and foremost that the book of Revelation, if we're going to understand it, we've got to first know that it is written in what is referred to as apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic literature is highly figurative, highly <clears throat> figurative. And so what we've got to do is carefully look at each part of the book of Revelation and understand what is literal and what is figurative. The 144,000 believed by the Jehovah's Witness, the Watchtower Society, that is, believed that heaven, the realm of God, only has room for 144,000. And this uh, Jehovah's Witness that stopped by and informed me that they've already been chosen, they're already there. And he says, I, I don't want to go there. I want to stay here on earth. That's what they teach, is that this earth will become a paradise, a garden paradise. You may have even seen some of their literature. I will say I am very much impressed with the artist's work in this uh, literature that the Jehovah's Witness puts off. It, it looks very inviting. It looks very fun. Some of it is that of large picnics in which huge families are eating with other families. And coming into this picnic are some of the wildest, most ferocious animals, lions, and tigers are laying down there next to those picnicking families. And what's interesting is years ago I saw some of this literature. Here is this perfect world, and I look closely at this picture, and one of the men in the picture 
was wearing glasses in heaven, in this perfect paradise. Uh, I, I have contacts. I, I need them. I'm blind if, uh, if I don't have them in. But I know this. If, if I'm going to picture a perfect paradise, I promise you I'm going to picture a place in which I can see clearly and not need glasses. The 144,000 that's mentioned in Revelation 14, verses 1 through 3, I want you to look there with me very briefly before we move on to the next false doctrine. Let's read these verses together and notice, again, this figurative language. John records, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty-four thousand. Now, what's interesting here is, they'll look at this lamb and they'll say, well, that's Jesus. They'll say it's a figurative lamb. But then they'll look at the hundred and forty-four thousand, and they'll say, but this is a literal 144,000. What we see in that number is a, a perfect number. And what God is showing is that a large amount, there is plenty of room in the realm of heaven. Plenty of room for those who are saved. And that is who the 144,000 represents. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 22, Peter asks a question about forgiveness you remember that Jesus gives a number. Peter, thinking, I believe, that he was very generous, asked, do we forgive seven times? And Jesus corrects him and says, I think again, he says, 70 times seven. Now what Jesus isn't teaching here is that you only have 490 opportunities to forgive. Jesus is giving an exaggerated number to show what? You don't stop forgiving. You keep on forgiving. And the next time that individual sins and repents, you forgive them. And over and over and over again, the 144,000, think of it as 490 in that same sense. It's an exaggerated number to show a large quantity of believers, those who are saved from the beginning of time to the end of time. This doctrine of heaven here on earth and only 144,000. If you look very closely, look at verse 2. I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song of the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. What's interesting is we see also something very important about these 144,000. Again, this figurative number. One, the Bible tells us that they're all virgins. That's not a literal virgin. That's a showing the purity of those who are in Christ Jesus. Likewise, it pictures them all as men, having not known a woman, it says. Meaning women aren't allowed in heaven, according to the Jehovah's Witness religion, if they're going to take it literally they have to take it all literally. And yet they refuse to do that. That's false doctrine number one. False doctrine number two. I want to talk briefly about the Mormon heaven. Now all of these people, Jehovah's Witness and, and Mormons, we love. And we want them in heaven, the heaven with us. And so it is our obligation to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every single creature. Every man, woman, we must bring the gospel to them no matter what their religion is because God, whether they are Jehovah's Witness or, or Mormons or Baptists or Methodists or Presbyterians or fill in the blank with whatever denomination you want to, God wants them in heaven and that's why we've got to preach the gospel to them. The Mormon heaven is really three heavens. The three parts of that are the telestial the terrestrial, and the celestial. And you think, well, they don't see anything like that in the Bible. And you are absolutely correct on that. Joseph Smith made these three realms up as he did with the entirety of the Book of Mormon. But let's look at each one of these when it comes to the Mormon heaven, the celestial. The celestial is the very best of the best. Those that were the best Mormons here on this earth those that were sealed in the temple and had a temple marriage ceremony had the opportunity to be in this celestial land. Let me tell you a little bit about this top heaven to the Mormons. You have the ability to, in fact, become 
a God of your own planet. They don't automatically go into this when they're trying to convert people to Mormonism, but this is ultimately what they believe. Mormons would consider themselves as monotheists. Mono meaning one, one God, but in reality they are polytheists. They believe in many gods and that every single Mormon can one day himself become like our God, have his own planet, like our God has earth, have a wife who is perpetually pregnant. I'm sorry, ladies, that's how life is for the Mormon women in all of eternity. You are perpetually pregnant, giving birth, and populating your own planet. The terrestrial. Those are for us, the area that Mormons teach. If you didn't make it to the celestial, if you weren't that good Mormon, maybe you were a Mormon, but you were a bad Mormon. Maybe you weren't a Mormon at all, but you were a, a, a good Baptist or a good Methodist. You were a righteous person altogether. Well, then you have the opportunity they teach to be in the terrestrial. Not as good as the celestial, but pretty good. Maybe you were an atheist, though. Maybe you in your life never accepted Jesus Christ, never believed him to be the Son of God. Maybe you were a Muslim. Maybe you were a practicing Jew. Well, that's where the telestial comes in. You have opportunity to be in that realm and maybe one day work your way up to the second, but never to the third. And hell, I know we're not talking about hell just tonight, but they believe that hell, or as they refer to, sons of perdition, are for the really, really bad people. Your Hitlers and your Mussolinis, those are the ones that go to hell, but everyone else goes to heaven. And again, you're looking at these as we've described them, and you say, this doesn't fit with Scripture, and you're absolutely right. Isaiah 44 and verse 6 speaks of God, and he says of himself, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. There is one God, not many, that are over many planets. Isaiah, the next chapter, 45 and verse 5, I am the Lord, and there is no other besides me. There is no God. The third false doctrine that I want to look at is, is one that is very prevalent, and that is the belief that the majority of people will just simply go to heaven. That when we die, if you were a good person, generally speaking, you were nice to people, oh, I'm sure you made your mistakes. Maybe you didn't go to church as much as you should have gone. Maybe you, you drank a little bit. Maybe you lied a little bit. But you know what? God loves you, and you're just going to go to heaven no matter what. Now, this false doctrine is, of course, absolutely smashed. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. The words of our Lord Jesus Christ here tells us, shows us, and proves to us that not only will the majority of the people that have lived on this earth go to hell, but he says there that few will go to heaven. He speaks there of the two different ways. He says, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Most will be lost. That's a, a sad fact, right? It's sad, but it's a fact. It is a truth. And to deny it is to deny the words of Christ. But I want to bring some edification into this verse. Now, there's plenty already there. I'm not adding to it. But for us tonight, in understanding that right now the majority of this world is headed to a devil's hell, should that not motivate us to go out and save these souls? Jesus has given us his word. He's given us... Romans 1 and verse 16, the power of God to salvation. That's what the gospel is. And we have the privilege, we have the honor to take it to our friends, to our neighbors, to our co-workers, to our family members who have yet to taste the joy 
of being in the kingdom of God. And we can save them by showing them Jesus. We can save them and snatch them from the fire. Now, the three we've looked at so far have all been generally those that we associate with the denominational world. But I want to, in the time that we have remaining, bring a false doctrine that though is prevalent in the denominational world, I'm sad to say it has been brought into the kingdom as well. And I want to preface it with these words. There are many who have held this view and continue to hold it. That I hold in a very dear place, love, absolutely love. And I, I, want to, I want to see them right with God. But the fact remains, this doctrine that I'm about to talk about is, is an error. And I want to show that here tonight. The doctrine is this. It is the belief that heaven is going to be here on this earth. And you think, well, that sounds a whole lot like the Jehovah's Witness heaven. And you're, you're right. It's very similar to the Jehovah's Witness heaven. But there's a song that we sing. And I want you to consider that if this false doctrine were true, this would be a song that we would no longer be able to sing. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. The premise of this false doctrine is that God is going to purify this earth. It's going to become, again, a garden paradise. Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit will come down here on earth and this will be heaven. It was made popular by a couple of uh, very famous denominational preachers. Randy Alcorn is probably the, the leader of this. He sold, in fact, more religious books than any religious author right now. Michael Whitmer is another. In fact, in Michael Whitmer's book, Heaven is a Place on Earth, he begins it with this phrase, I don't want to go to heaven. And he doesn't. He wants to stay right here on this earth. Is this an issue that we, that we need to talk about? Is it a, a matter of opinion? Is it, well, you believe this and I believe this? I believe that there are matters of opinion. That is very clear on that. But then there's matters of doctrine. And I'll give you an illustration of this. The oneness of the church. That Jesus established one church. And that I've got to be a member of that one church in order to be saved. Is that a matter of opinion? Or is that a matter of doctrine? That's a matter of doctrine. Here's another Jesus has said, if I want entrance into his kingdom, I've got to be baptized into him. I've got to put him on in baptism. I believe that without baptism, we cannot be saved. I'm not talking about safe people like our little precious innocent children. I'm talking about those who have reached that age of accountability. Every single one of us that has reached that age is required by God to be baptized. Is that a matter of opinion or is that a matter of doctrine? doctrine? That is a matter of doctrine. That is set in stone. How do we know the difference between matters of opinion and matters of doctrine? In clear-cut teachings of our Lord Jesus, we cannot call them matters of opinion. Look at 2 John 9. 2 John 9, we see this promise, really this warning that he gives Whoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. He that abides in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. Now, the doctrine of Christ is simply another word for teaching of Christ. Verse 10, if there come in any unto you and bring not this doctrine. What doctrine? The doctrine of Christ. Something that Jesus has taught. Receive him not into your house. Neither bid him Godspeed, for he that bids him Godspeed is a partaker of his evil deeds. If we can show that this doctrine denies the doctrine of Christ, then we can associate it with error, with false doctrine, and not a matter of opinion, but rather a, a matter of false doctrine. All right, so three things, and the lesson is then going to be yours. Three things in which this doctrine of heaven on earth denies. 
Number one, it denies the doctrine of heaven itself and that heaven and earth are separate entities, separate places. Look at the words of Jesus in John 14. We looked at this on Sunday morning in our lesson on heaven. And it's quite an encouraging passage. But look at the wording that our Lord uses here. John 14, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now notice this wording. I go. Where is Jesus when he says this? He's on earth, isn't he? And he's saying this language, I go to prepare a place for you. He doesn't say, I'm staying to prepare this place for you. He speaks of going somewhere else to prepare a different place. And look at verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Now the argument is, well, he's talking about receiving them here on this earth, but it doesn't say that. That where I am, there ye may be also. Or how about this very important passage? Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. Jesus is teaching his disciples and us still today the importance of putting the kingdom before the physical. And he says here, lay up for yourselves treasures where? In heaven, where moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The comparison, and this is thrilling to me, brethren, the comparison between things here on this earth, moth and rust does corrupt, thieves break in and steal, versus the heavenly realm where moth and rust do not corrupt, where thieves aren't even allowed. Revelation 21 tells us nothing that works a lie is allowed into heaven and thieves are liars. When we see the difference between heaven and earth and all the pain and suffering that we have to face here, God says heaven is a place in which none of that is there. So lay up for your treasure in heaven. Matthew 5, verses 34 and verse 35, we see again the comparison of two different places, heaven and earth. Jesus warns, I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. Now, the Jews at this time thought themselves pretty tricky, and they would not swear by the name of God, but they would say, well, I swear by heaven. Or I swear by the temple. And they wouldn't have to really keep that swear, that promise that they were making. And God is saying, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. But if you notice right here, look at the description that he says. What is heaven? It's God's throne. What is earth? It's his footstool. One of, I think, the most detrimental aspects of this doctrine is that what we attempt to do, brethren, is we attempt to take the footstool of God and we try to turn that into his throne. And we can't do that. We can't do that. Comparing the old law and the new law, Hebrews 13 and verse 14 speaks of those in the old law and us in the new. And he says, for we here have no continuing city. He's talking about Jerusalem for the old law. That was their city. That was the holy city. And he says, those of us in the church, those of us that are under the law of Jesus Christ, we have no continuing city. Why? Because our citizenship is in heaven. Folks, we can get so caught up in politics. Now, I do not believe that it is wrong to, to vote. I, I think that God has given us a blessing in allowing us to have a vote. But at the same time, we've got to understand that we are not first and foremost citizens of the United States. While I am thankful for the freedom we have, I am thankful for the United States of America. I'm a citizen of heaven first. And my life has been given to Jesus before it's been given to any president of the United States. Amen. We've got to live that. That is our home. Here on this earth, we worry about all the things we're worried about now. 
but in heaven it's not there. These worries aren't there because it's a different place. It's a different reality. The second part. The second thing that it denies is the, the doctrine of a, of a renovated earth, of a heaven on earth, denies the doctrine of the resurrection. We talked a little bit about that yesterday, didn't we? John 5, 28 and 29, Jesus says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good to the resurrection of life and they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. Paul to the church of Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, takes that doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of the resurrection, and he puts a magnifying glass to it. And he shows us, he shows the brethren there in Thessalonica and us reading it today, what it's actually going to look like, what that resurrection for the saved is going to look like. And he says there in verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. We looked at that word together yesterday. That wonderful word. We will be caught up together with them where? In the clouds. We are, the Bible tells us, going up. Where's heaven? Well, up is a, is a physical direction, isn't it? And heaven is a, a spiritual place. But here we see, at least at the destruction of this earth, we're going up and we're going to meet Jesus in the clouds. Notice it says to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Another doctrine that this absolutely crushes is the doctrine of premillennialism. That this world, we're going to have a thousand year reign of Christ here. That's absolutely foreign from the New Testament as well. This doctrine denies the doctrine of the resurrection. And number three, this doctrine denies the doctrine of earth's destruction. If I say the name Billy Sol Estes, many of you have probably heard that name. In the 1960s here in this country, he was involved in quite a bit of politics. Had done through some very dishonest things, very well for himself considering. What many don't know is that he was actually a member of the Lord's Church. We kind of like to keep that a secret sometimes. But Billy Sol Estes, serving as an elder in the Lord's Church, was a, a very big fan of our brother Marshall Keeble. You all heard of Brother Marshall Keeble. Brother Keeble was doing a meeting where Brother Estes was serving as an elder and Brother Estes had him out to the ranch. He said, while dinner's being prepared, let's get in the truck. I want to show you. And he drove him around. He showed him all his barns. He showed him all his horses. showed him all of his, his properties. They finally get back to the main house. And Billy Sol Estes smiles, smirks really at Brother Keeble. And he goes, what do you think of all this? And Brother Keeble says, I think it's all going to get burned up. <laughs> Every bit of it. There's nothing wrong with having nice things. I know that. You know that. If we understand that this world is going to be destroyed. Look over at 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter is so very clear as to the future of this world. Look at verse 10. He's talking about the day of the Lord. That is the day in which Christ returns. We were just looking at it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. What happens? This is part 2. This is a continuation of that day that Paul was writing of. Peter says what happens after we meet the Lord in the air and are forever with Him. Verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. 
I want to start backwards and work my way. The new heaven and new earth is used four times in the entire Bible. Isaiah 65, Isaiah 66, here in 2 Peter 3, and in Revelation 21. And here's an interesting fact about the use of new heaven and new earth. Every single time it's used, it is always a reference to something figurative. Or rather, it is figurative. Isaiah 65 and 66 is talking about the new covenant. 2 Peter 3 and Revelation 21, it is referring to our new home in heaven. This heaven and earth, not the heaven realm of God, but the sky above us, the earth below us, will be destroyed. It will be burned up. I want to look at each of these words very briefly. And I want to ask ourselves this question. You, you remember, you remember in school when your English teacher had an assignment for you? And she said, all right, I want everyone to write a theme. Or later on, we called it an essay, didn't we? I want you to write an essay. And suppose you were given the assignment. I want you to write an essay about the earth being renovated and made into heaven here on earth. What words would you use? What words would you use to describe it? Because I can guarantee you this. You would not use the same words that the Holy Spirit had Peter use. Look at each one of these. Look at this first one. It's the term pass away. What does that mean? We use that term as a euphemism for what? Yeah. For death. When someone dies, we, we, don't, we want to soften that, that phrase. We say, well, they, they passed away last night. And that's okay. This word means that very same thing. Parakomai is the Greek word here. You don't have to know that. But I do want to look at a few places in which it is used. It means to perish, to pass, to pass away, to transgress. It's used in Matthew 14. I, this is one of my favorite uses of this word. Matthew 14 and verse 15. Jesus says, this is a desert place and the time is now parakomai, past. He uses it to describe time that will never happen again. It's past. That's what this world is going to be. It's going to be past. It's going to pass away. It's used in Matthew 24 and verse 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away. He's talking there of the destruction of Jerusalem. And he says, there's people standing right here now who are still going to be alive. This generation will not pass until these things come to, to happen. That's the same word, pass away. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Aren't you thankful? Let us make on this one. Aren't you thankful that God has taken our sins away from us? Amen. You think about what you've done in your life. Things you're embarrassed about. And God, the Bible says, it describes that God has taken them and thrown them into the deepest part of the ocean. That's the imagery that the psalmist uses. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17 Look what it says. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are parakomai. They are passed away. That's the same Greek word that is used to describe what's going to happen to this earth. Our sins have not been renovated. Aren't you thankful for that? Our sins have not been made new. They've been completely taken away. And God tells us what in the book of Hebrews? I will remember them no more. Here's another word, melt. Also the word dissolve. Lyo is the Greek word here. And again, you don't have to know that, but it's translated as melt and dissolve both in this context. The same word in verses 11 and 12 now, the King James translates it there as the, as the word dissolve, but when you see melt and dissolve, it's that same Greek word. Both terms, I believe, are very fitting for this context. More times than not, in, in the King James, it's translated as the word loose. And one of, uh, of those great uses in Matthew 21, in Matthew chapter 21, 
Jesus sends his disciples to a certain village. He says, saying unto them, Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. He tells his disciples, You're going to find them tied. I want you to dissolve that tie. I want you to loose it. They're not tied to it anymore. Peter uses the word in his declaration of Christ's resurrection and that whom God hath raised up having loosed the pains of death. He's completely dissolved. He's completely melted the pains of death and allowed what? Jesus Christ to resurrect. What do these words mean? How about the term burned up? Would you use that term if you were writing an essay on the earth being burned? reconstructed for us to live here on burned up such a concept is understood by even the simplest of minds katakayo matthew 3 and verse 12 that same word is used whose fan is in his hand he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner but he will katakayo he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire what happened to the shaft was it renovated or was it completely destroyed? Completely melted, completely dissolved. The earth was never intended to be our home. Never intended to be our home. In fact, over and over again, we are warned not to love this world. Of not the world, neither the things that are in it. What's the purpose? I've asked myself the question, what is the purpose of this doctrine? And I believe that those who believe it, I believe they're well-meaning. I honestly believe that. But at the same time, being well-meaning does not make me correct. Paul before he became an apostle of Jesus Christ, before Ananias took him into that watery grave and his sins were washed away, Paul was a very well-meaning Jew, wasn't it? And he killed Christians, or at least had them killed, arrested them, hurt them. And he, he did it in ignorance. He was well-meaning, though. What's the point of all? When we take the words of Christ, this is why it's so essential, I believe, to discuss false doctrines when it comes to heaven. Because when we take the words of Christ about heaven, we're taking hope. That's what Jesus gives us with his words. Hope. And when we start questioning the truth that Jesus has given us, if we start going after heaven, where are we going to stop? Will we change the doctrine of hell? Will we change the doctrine of the steps of salvation? Will we change morality? When we start messing with the words of Christ, we mess with truth. And that is always forbidden. Always forbidden. You've been such a good audience. I've preached longer than I normally do. And your attention has been so great. The lesson is yours. Tomorrow night, we're going to talk about false doctrines about hell. Please come and join us. Bring your friends. Bring your neighbors. If you're here and you're not a member of the body of Jesus Christ, we invite you to become one tonight. Why not tonight? What have you, what have you else to do than become a member of the body of Jesus Christ? The water's prepared. It's ready. We want to facilitate it. Maybe you already studied and you know what you need to do. Maybe you've known for some time, but maybe you put it off. I don't know why. I don't know what's been in your heart. But why not take the step out of the pew tonight? Come and let it be known that you're ready to obey Jesus. You get to put on Christ in baptism. Come and do it right now. Please come while we stand and sing.